Hi everyone, my name is Mustafa Kidi and I'm the industry consultant here at Torrens University Australia. Welcome to today's panel session. I'm delighted to be joined by a special guest. With us today we have industry guest Peter Seema, Director of Planning Strategies. We also have with us Associate Professor Justin Pearce, Director of Innovation, Industry and Employability, um, covering the Business and, and Hospitality Faculty from Torrens University Australia. Um, and lastly, we have Alex Bolt, Director of uh, MBA programs at Torrens University Australia. I'm going to start off with Peter Seema. Uh, so I'll give you a bit of an introduction about Peter. Peter has been the CEO of a number of large organisations, uh, and this includes councils, companies and authorities. Um, included in this, in this impressive list is Peter being the CEO of, CEO of cities of Essendon, um, Greater Bendigo and Sydney. This is just to name a few. He was also the CEO of Federation Square uh, in Melbourne in its building and early operational phase. Um, he currently has a portfolio of advisory roles with large private companies, state and local governments. Um, it is, it is, he's got an impressive CV, as you can see, and we are incredibly lucky to have him with us today. Peter, let's start with you. Being the CEO of Federation Square in its early operational phase, what were some of your challenges? The main challenge was um, uncertainty. No one really knew where it was going. We didn't have plans for the construction. It was also incredibly um, visible to the public. Uh, there's nowhere to hide in the corner of um, uh, Swanson and um, Flinders. Uh, and it was a, a very, very uh, testing time. We all knew that we didn't have anything like enough money to build it. Uh, the architects hadn't done the design while we were still constructing it at the same time. Uh, and there was great uncertainty about who we were. We were a, basically a start-up company. It was owned by the government, but actually making... Uh, getting all of those pieces to play and working them through was a really big challenge. Fantastic. So I would imagine that, um, you know, there was, there was a lot of skills that were required at the time to make sure that, that you, you, you know, you were successfully able to, you know, pass those challenges. I think so. I think that one of the things that uh, helped was we had some people that were quite skilled in various areas, but quite broadly based. They'd been there before, they'd done things before. Lord, no one had built Federation Square before, and we weren't specialist construction people. We were good at running uh, organisations. We were good at being sufficiently technical to understand so that we weren't total, um, totally out of it uh, and just being led by a few uh, professionals who were specialists. We needed the broad base of skills to work our way through and clearly dealing with government, dealing with the public, dealing with grumpy contractors that were trying to rip you off and all sorts of things. So yeah, it was really, that was one of the main things. And, and I would imagine you had a number of university graduates um, in those teams um, overlooking some of these projects, yeah? No, I presume that from my team that they're all university graduates. <laughs> Fantastic. So Peter, how can universities best prepare their students for future needs of industry? Because we know industry is changing. Um, but but how, what, what can universities do so that students are not, or, or students of today are not puzzled when they are faced with industry challenges? And when I say students, I'm talking about even current industry leaders that are undertaking postgraduate you know, studies. Look, I think the best thing uh, the universities can do is to get people a little bit excited about what their role is. And there's, there's, you've got to do your coursework, you've got to have try things. The more, from a practical point of view, the more hands-on experience you can get, the better. And having a broad base of things and not being too specialist and not necessarily believing everything you read in a book. It's really, it's, it's, it's a lot about um, preparing people to get off the world. And the best thing you can do is somebody who really wants to get something done and really find this is a challenge, this is something that's really enjoyable. Um, you know, who'd want to sort of sit at home for coronavirus when you can be out building Federation Square? You know, the, 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 so it's that sort of uh, passion that the, the best staff I've always had are people that are pretty passionate about what they do. So it's really important to be passionate, but it's also really important to be hands-on is what you're saying. And, and maybe, you know, involve themselves with, with projects in real life while they're studying before, before they graduate and before they yeah. enter industry. Or if they're yeah. already in industry, to, to really get that exposure. I think it's really good to, if people can, um, uh, they've got to do their base bachelor's degrees. But when they move on to higher level things, I think it's always good to keep one foot in the industry, still working 
and at the same time doing your education. It's what I did for a couple of master's degrees. And it's basically I did them part time. But you didn't lose a couple of years of your life experience uh, or your Chris by going and closing the door and going back to other universities. So I think that that's sort of learning as you go and that blend of practical experience plus uh, what you read in the different um, texts and things like that is really important. Things make more sense to you when you've got one foot in the real world. Fantastic. Well, with that, I'm, I'm, I'm now going to move over to Justin Pierce um, to learn more about the value of an MBA and, and industry connectedness. Now, um, allow me to introduce Justin. Justin, as I said, is the Director of Innovation, Industry and Employability, covering business and hospitality faculties, faculties at Torrens University, Australia. Um, with a teaching career that spans three decades, um, a professional and consulting career, Justin steered the Torrens MBA during its, uh, its expansion period. Um, and that was at a time when, when, when we had opened three new campuses um, where he led a team of 80 staff to deliver what would become one of Australia's best MBA programs. Um, today, Justin ensures uh, the full suite of programs in the business and hospitality faculty at Torrens University Australia are representative of industry need and that graduates leave the programs um, ready to, you know, to participate and add value to industry. Um, in this respect, I would, I would probably say Justin's role is all about engaging with the community and industry. So Justin, um, what value will, will an MBA add, let's say, uh, to, to someone's job or career? I was, I was delighted to hear Peter talk uh, earlier about their needing to be a kind of broad base to, to somebody's skill set. And um, it's, it's remarkable too, because an MBA is a different, dare I say, master's program. It's different because we're normally specialising in, in a field. Um, take, for example, a Master of Finance or Master of Education. Um, practically, most things that you're going to be doing in that sort of master's is going to be uh, very specialised and very uh, honing in on, uh, on that particular discipline. But an MBA does not. An MBA, I like to describe an MBA as, as a bit of a tasting platter. and what I mean by that is that it's underpinned by what we call the functional view of business. Um, and in a modern business, we have functions such as marketing and finance and operations and maybe people management or, or HR, but they are functions that, that come together. And what we try to do is espouse a uh, cross-functional view of these functions so that we can uh, have a professional together um, but also the nuances of, of how people come together themselves, their motivations, their how to get the best out of them. Um, and I, I also loved how Peter mentioned also about having that, that drive and that self-directedness uh, and, and a passion being, being the key uh, to that. So fundamentally, they get the tasting platter, so they get the best bits out of all of it, uh, rather than uh, specialising in, in any one of them. Uh, thank you, Justin. Yeah, you're, you're certainly right. So it, it provides a holistic view is what you're saying. Um, I am, yeah. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. So, you know, being industry connected, I, I mean, we, we, we saw that Peter also touched on that um, as well. What networking opportunities are there for industry professionals? You know, whether they're, you know, particularly when they become students at Torrance University. Right. Well, um, I mean, we've got a whole program of, of activities where we bring industry into the classroom, but where we're also uh, bringing the students uh, out into industry, right? So it's almost like a, a two-way or, or a two-pronged approach, right? Um, as we are conceiving of, of new courses, we bring the industry in uh, to a meeting. And so at the high level, we're suggesting uh, that we design or we co-create our courses with industry and we need to do that because we need to make sure that if people are going to make the investment and it's a rather large financial investment it's a rather large time uh, investment and there's also the opportunity costs of, of what you can't do while you spend that time studying then we need to make sure and it's incumbent upon the university uh, ethically I think to make sure that whatever they're going to study is is going to be industry relevant uh, when they get to 
uh, their, their graduation day, or even as, as what we find at Torrens University, uh, the students are able to make valuable and impactful contributions back to their uh, industry setting uh, straight away. So we take it from a top down, but then also a bottom up uh, viewpoint. We inject the industry into the classroom through uh, in engaging with uh, uh, people that we bring into the classroom. Many of our uh, teaching staff are current industry practitioners. Um, to the tune of about 65% uh, of them or, or, or so. So they've got present current consulting uh, skills or, or they're otherwise running their own businesses and they can, they can walk the walk, right? So, and, and if it's not that, uh, then the university also has a, a program of um, uh, in, internships and uh, where we can make the current work setting that those people who are mixing current uh, industry experience and study, we can integrate the current setting of their work into their learning as well. So a, a number of different ways, Mustafa. That's fantastic. I mean, I'm, I'm really impressed to hear that over 50% of our lecturers are effectively already in industry. They've, they've, yeah. they've already seen the challenges firsthand. So they're not, you know, um, you know they, they haven't just sort of risen to the ranks just through academia. But they've also been out there. They've seen industry challenges. They're, they've experienced what it's like, you know, to, to, to face business Absolutely. challenges. Yeah. And if I could just add, add to that as well, just for a little bit of context, there's other disciplines out there, such as, say, medicine. Um, and medicine has got a long history of the practitioners themselves will continue to uh, do research and they'll continue to uh, maybe hold a, uh, a, a clinical uh, professorial appointment. And by that, they continue to be engaged with the university and they continue to push the lines of discovering new knowledge. And in the current climate that we're in, things like that are going to make, uh, make impact, but also continue to build networks between the industry and the university as well. So what we find is that if we have that uh, percentage of our teaching staff who are in the industry, then we're approaching uh, what has been done traditionally in, in those other professions, such, such as medicine where the link between the industry and the university is so strong and remains strong. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty pleased and, and very proud that Torrance University has been able to, to do that. Brilliant. Th thank you, Justin. Um, I'm going to turn to Alex Bolt now to better understand what it's actually like to, to study an MBA. Um, so Alex is the program director of, of our MBA programs here at Torrance University Australia. He is also the chairman of AirSmart. Um, I would say that he's an accomplished and visionary CEO, uh, an entrepreneurial leader, team builder, project manager, design thinker, negotiator, and results-oriented sales and marketing manager, to say the least. Um, we, are we, are, we are incredibly lucky to have him um, with us. Um, and, and Alex being highly skilled at product commercialization in the past, he has been responsible for over a dozen successful national, national product launches. Um, he's also the founder and executive editor of two national magazines. Um, being, being, being the director of the MBA programs, um, what is the return on investment for someone doing an MBA? Starting straight with the money. It's like, almost like you're talking to somebody from a business school. There's an immediate return on investment. But, but it's an interesting thing because any of us who are skilled in business would be looking at return in, in, on investment in a pure dollar sense. Uh, and the stats in Australia certainly demonstrate that, that graduates leaving postgraduate study um, uh, can expect to be employed in, in quite serious income, at a quite serious income level within three years of leaving their study. But that's not really what I'm going to answer the question with, Mustafa. The return on investment is what we actually, end, what the students end up with at the end of the program. We're, we're about changing people. So people might think they come to a program and learn all kinds of things. Um, I want to try and uh, demonstrate the difference between us teaching and them learning. Um, the reality is that it is a process and it is a program. So entering the MBA program, as Justin mentioned earlier, it's a broad-based skills program. And we move you through all of the disciplines, such as marketing, management, leadership, those kinds of things. But Along the way, the journey changes you. 
because what we are trying to do with our, our MBA students is um, inculcate reflective practice so that they are continually learning from their own experience. Um, we're, we're obviously teaching from textbooks and theoretical applications, but that evidence-based learning is a mindset that our students develop too, um, so that they actually look for the evidence rather than base decisions on opinions. And ultimately, these two core principles of being able to look inside yourself and look for your own abilities and how you can change, how you can temper your emotional intelligence, how you can temper your skills so that you are learning continually about how you can improve. That's really what an MBA does so that we end up with industry or professional practitioners at the end that are able to be measured. They are able to balance their opinion with fact to be able to look for theoretical advantages. And no matter what subjects you're studying and in the MBA program, we're teaching people to be critical thinkers, to be able to say, this is the evidence that I see, but what does it mean? And to be able to look beyond that. I was so pleased that Peter mentioned all of the points that an MBA touches on. Uncertainty, to have broad-based skills, to be able to communicate with diverse stakeholders, and to be best prepared to be able to be enthusiastic and passionate about what you do, and to keep one foot in industry while studying. I think they are tremendous pillars to start looking at. So the long-winded answer to your question, what is the return on investment? You end up leaving a much better version of you than when you started. That's what we aim to achieve. Brilliant, Alex. And, and so if someone, let's say, is already in industry and you know, they're working as a, as a leader, um, are they able to apply their, their, their experiences from their current workplace into projects or assignments that they're working on? Absolutely. Um, we, as Justin mentioned, we have a unique advantage at Torrens University is that we are a privately owned university. We're a business and all of the academic staff are not only highly academically qualified, but have that foot in industry or, as well. So coming from, an industri coming from industry experience, most are still practicing um, practitioners either on boards of companies or industry bodies or actually working as consultants in industry. So that's how you learn. And when we have students that come to us, many of whom are employed in full-time positions, um, they wish to solve problems that are real-world problems within their industry or within the companies they're working for. And all of our um, different subjects give you the opportunity to be able to use those case studies, real case studies, in the assignments that you're presenting. It makes it real. It goes back to what Peter was saying about being passionate and enthusiastic. If it's a real world problem, people are, are, are very engaged in, in trying to solve that. So yes. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. But I, I would like now, I'd like to turn to the, you know, the teaching style now, um, Alex. Um, I mean, is the course flexible? And, and, and you know, are there you know, flexible study options provided? You know, I mean, I, we know that with Torrens University, everything is remote, work, remote learning. But will it stay that way post COVID-19? Uh, no, it won't. Um, there, there's always been, at Torrens, we've also been able, uh, always delivered both as an online program and a face-to-face -face program. There's different skills, there's different practicalities that you can apply in both. Um, so we're not going to stay entirely online. Obviously, we're at the mercy of the world and the Australian government as to when we go back face-to-face. -face. But it's not a negative thing to be learning online. Both have some advantages and disadvantages. And obviously, in a perfect world, we'll go back to both. Both. I think the second part of your question is interesting, flexibility. Uh, our programs are always made up of a core component, subjects that you must do. And again, it's not us telling the students you must do this. It's us saying, as JP mentioned earlier, um, you've got to have broadly based skills. So we hope that many of our students go on to be industry leaders. And why are we teaching them finance? We're teaching them finance because if they're an industry leader, they'll need to know what the CFO is doing in their organisation. So they need to have enough of an understanding. They need to understand what the marketing department are doing. They need to understand what other divisions are doing. So while it's a broadly based um, university study, it's pre preparing future leaders so that they're able to actually understand the organisation as a whole. That's half of the learning is the core. 
Uh, we then provide in all of our programs, the other half are what's called electives. And in those elective subjects, you can draw from any um, um, courses that we offer across our university, bearing in mind that we, we have obviously a range of business related electives, but we also have programs such as um, the Masters of Information System, Business Information System. You can choose subjects out of there. You can choose subjects from sports. You can choose subjects from project management. So you're able to actually, if you like, define what you need for the industries or industry that you're currently working in. So we give a lot of flexibility in order, in order that students can actually tailor their career. Yeah, Alex, and, and th does the MBA have specialisations at Torrance University? And, and is it best to start with a graduate certificate um, before heading down a path of a specialisation? That's an interesting question. Um, I think Justin and myself would both advise students be ready for the journey. So the difference between students who do well and students who struggle is perhaps they're not ready for the journey. I think you need to be ready to undertake learning. And we offer a lot of different options to do that. So there are people that feel like they want to refresh their learning. They, a grad, grad cert, which is four subjects within the MBA, they are all exactly the same subjects that you would study within the MBA, but you can get a grad cert done um, and you can feel like you've actually topped up your learning or you've developed skills that you needed to develop by just doing a grad cert. Um, and there's others that are ready to take on an MBA at various different levels. We offer a lot of different programs, whether that be over 18 months or two years to do your MBA or your advanced MBA. And so students really need to examine themselves and decide where they're up to and what they need at this point in time. Beyond those two areas, there's also the opportunity for um, people to come and study with us and build a program. So they may not yet be ready to know what, where they want to go and what they want to specialise in. We help them on that journey too. Brilliant. Th thank you, Alex. Now, um, I'm going to move over to Justin now, um, while we're still sort of hot on the topic of MBA. Um, Justin, we recently saw in the CEO magazine's 2020 global MBA rankings, Torrance University Australia being only one of 11 um, universities to have achieved tier one status for global MBA rankings. Tell us, what does this mean? Thanks for the question. It was, uh, it was a delightful result that we got. Uh, that's right. We were... Uh, as Torrens University, Australia was one of 11 Australian universities to be ranked as uh, tier one by the CEO magazine. We also ranked as number 20 uh, overall in the world for our online MBA program. What does it mean? It means that uh, Alex uh, Bolt and I actually uh, sat down and, and we had to uh, provide a lot of data, right? So we had to uh, provide this, which was then, you know, so CEO magazine essentially became a third party or if you like an, an, an accrediting body, uh, an, an unofficial term. But uh, so they then took all of that same data from every other university that uh, wanted to be graded and uh, did a ranking exercise with it. So we answered uh, with questions such as, you know, well, how many of our teaching staff have got current industry practice? How many of them are currently doctoral qualified? Uh, what is the overall uh, demography of our students? Meaning, are there, uh, you know, as, as many representation of women and men? Um, funnily enough, we have more women in our MBA than, than we have men. Uh, and, and also the, the background of them being representative, I guess, I guess of the multiculturalism that that's, uh, makes up an Australian uh, lifestyles but uh, yeah so what it means is we put it all forward uh, everything about what we do and, and what we've built over, over this time and we put it open to scrutiny by a third party and they come back and they said you guys are pretty good brilliant well congratulations to you and Alex Bolton the team at Torrens Thank um, you, sir. Peter Peter before we finish off um, I'd like to ask this question to you now um, what would be the top attributes um, that companies are looking for in job candidates? And, and what would be your advice um, to those for, for those who are about to undertake an MBA? I'd love to hear from you on that. Um, answering the, the second part first, 
Uh, I think that's what I said before. I think that if you can, if you've got the time and the money, it's really important to continue ongoing education if you want to be um, uh, in a senior role, doing an MBA is as good as any other courses you'll get. It is obviously specifically tailored to people who want to um, enhance their uh, careers in, in, a, in a management sense. So uh, that's very good. As I said before, I'd really recommend um, doing it part-time. Uh, and if you can start off with a grad certificate, that's great. And because you're getting your... Um, uh, you going. You will have something, even if for some unknown reason you had to pull out halfway through, which I did once at an economics course. I went travelling instead, which was really good. Um, the but then I did my other master's degrees part time, and uh, it, it really did, did make a difference. Working and learning at the same time, both things enhanced each other. Um, to your first question about what do people are looking for, um, I can. I don't know if I can talk on behalf of everybody, but I certainly know what I was looking for when I employed people, and that is basically someone who, um, uh, above all, someone who wants to be there doing the work. And it's the first big question. A lot of people come in and they think that, oh, yes, this is going to, it's going to be um, uh, really good. I don't have to work too hard. And all that sort of thing. Well, they're not the people that I was interested in. I was interested in the people that really wanted to make a difference and be part of a team that actually drives successful outcomes. So I'll be looking for academic qualifications, I'd be looking at uh, references, particularly from references from people that I knew, uh, and I'd be looking at um, what they've done in the past. And I was looking at for them actually showing some interest and excitement and actually achieving what the job was about. So that's what I'd always be looking for in a new employee, enthusiasm as well as the background. Fantastic. Um, well, look, thank you so much, Peter. Um, it, this, this sort of brings us to an end for this session. Um, and I hope you've all enjoyed tuning in um, I, I, know I certainly have. Um, you know, we've, we've sort of really um, touched on so many points. Um, I don't know if it would do me justice to, to summarise it, um, but I hope that a recording will be available uh, for those uh, who wish to, to, to revisit this. Um, and for those of you who, you know, who, who are wishing to pursue an MBA or other studies with Torrens University of Australia, I wish you the very best of luck. I'm sure you will not be disappointed. Um, as you know, my advice is the same as, as the panel's. Um, it, you know, be industry connected. If you can do it part time, um, but most importantly, have that industry experience. We, we cannot sort of overstate that. Um, I would like to thank our guests for, for their time. Um, it was an ap absolute privilege to hear from you all. Um, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Justin and Alex. Um, thank, thank you for coming along today and sharing your, your knowledge. Pleasure. Thank you. thank you for having me.